Good afternoon and welcome to the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Christmas Lecture 2012, live from Lacabre High School. We would like to welcome the students who are in attendance today from schools across Lacabre and also those who are joining us on the live BBC Scotland webcast around the United Kingdom. We are delighted to welcome Catherine Granger to our school today to deliver the Royal Society of Edinburgh Christmas Lecture, The Journey to Gold. We hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Thank you all for being here. Is it better than being in class? Yes. You don't know yet. You don't know. Beautiful, beautiful to be up here as well. Gorgeous snowy mountains today that we've managed to block out with the curtains. I like that. <laughs> lovely. Out there, apparently, beautiful view. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. It has been the most incredible year for me. And uh, obviously, I'd love to talk about 2012, but I will go back in time, take you all back with me about how I got going and, and my career. And the, the story is the journey, the journey up to this year and this wonderful summer. And it is slightly ridiculous me standing here as a four time Olympian now, and now finally Olympic champion, because I had no plans to do this in my life at all. I was not one of these kids who at the age of four wanted to win the Olympics. And I know a few people who did. But most people I've met who've done what they've done have found over the years and years what they wanted to be as they got on. Uh, when I was your age at school, I had never rode before. I actually did karate at school. Um, I am also black belt. In case any of you get any ideas. <laughs> I have other skills. It's not, it's not a challenge, I don't want to take any of you on, but if you do get unruly, I'm just warning you. Uh, and in fact, the only, the only time I was in a boat at all when I was at school, I'd ne I was growing up in Glasgow, and I had next door neighbours, uh, the Simpson family, who were hugely into rowing, and there was, uh, they, the, the mum and dad were involved, and they had a son and daughter, and they were involved, and the son uh, was my age, and yes, he was the boy next door. I know. That's a different lecture. We're not going into that story today. Uh, but, yeah. And he used to come round and chat to me on the doorstep and talk about rowing and show that uh, in rowing you get quite workmanlike hands and you get blisters and calluses and he thought that was really attractive to a girl. You see, you're not easy as not, is it? It's not going to win you over. So I just wasn't going there, wasn't interested. And then uh, eventually they said, oh, just, I've got a big sister who's a year older than me. Why don't your sister and you come down and go rowing, see what you think. So to sort of say, OK, we'll try. We went with two other friends, went out in a boat, the four of us. And I don't even, you know, I don't have strong memories of it. We just went out for this one outing, four of us in a boat, fine. Now, that was it, as far as I'm concerned. My career in rowing finished at that point. And a few years ago, I spoke to my mum about this day. In fact, she brought it up and she said, oh, I so remember Gordon, who was the husband, coming back and saying to, to me, oh, Mrs. Granger, you have one of your daughters who has outstanding talent for this sport, could be really good. And I never heard this at the time. And I said, Mum, why don't you tell me? Because, you know, everyone needs a bit of confidence and encouragement. And if you told me then, I could have started earlier and instead of three silvers and a gold, it could have been four golds. And I was going on. And then she went, Catherine, enough. It was your sister he was talking about. <laughs> That's not actually a funny story. That was <laughs> So my sister, who's never taken up rowing, stays at home now with her feet up going, well, of course, if I'd done it, I'd have won every Olympics I did. I was the better sister. So uh, I was always sporty, but not necessarily designed for sporting great at that point. I went through to Edinburgh University and uh, actually thought I'd do karate at that point because I was still doing that and went around the Freshers' Fair, which if you, if you guys go into university, any of you are college or anything else, you get, someone had said to me before you go, you get all these amazing opportunities. You've got to try everything and, and have a go at everything. Everything legal. And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you're all far too well behaved to think about these things, surely. So I then signed up. I was going to have this, I was quite sporty. I thought I'd have all these slightly exciting adventure sports. So I looked into, sailing and skiing. In fact, it was lovely driving up here today because we were, I used to ski at Glencoe, which is happy memories. Uh, sailing and skiing and abseiling and, and climbing. And 
I, I was very interested in the trampoline club and I joined the juggling club and my juggling career still is non-existent, but it's a good pastime. And so I joined all these clubs thinking I'm going to do all this different stuff. I was on my own. I, was, I saw a friend who was at the Freshers' Fair as well. I thought, we'd walk back to Halls. What else, you know, what else do you want to go and see before we head back? And she said, I've got one more club to see. I'm going to go and speak to the rowing stall. And I thought, well, been there, done that, not going there again. And she went along, started talking to them. And I hung back looking at my information about when the next juggling club was meeting and things. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's a good club. And, uh, and then this girl approached me. I said, oh, did you want to hear about rowing? I said, no. No, no, no. Uh, just hanging around. She said, okay. So she went away. And then she came back. She don't want to be rowing. No. No, no, no. I'm busy. Climbing next weekend. And, uh, and then she said, oh, you'd be really quite good. You've got the right height and build um, for it, which a lot of rowers get, because a lot of rowers have to be quite tall and reasonably strong. In fact, this is a slight tangent. First time we met the Queen, you get to meet the Queen after the Olympic team competes and uh, she got introduced to us and she said, oh, I know you're rowers, you're all quite large. <laughs> now that's not a compliment either. I mean, she's quite small, but I didn't say anything, so that's fine. Um, so, so anyway, so she said, height and build, why don't you try rowing? And I went, no, I'm not interested. And she said, come along, Thursday night there's a meeting. Mm, not sure. Come along, we'll, we'll go out for a drink afterwards. Maybe I'm a bit interested. Uh, I went along, and there was 52 women novices signed up that day, and they only wanted 16. So I'm still not interested in rowing, but I'm quite competitive. In fact, I'm really quite horrifically competitive. And I thought, I'm not interested, but I might try and get into that 16. I'm not bothered, but I'd quite like to get into 16. Went through all the trials, made the 16, and then... Even then, I, you know, it was fine, it was fun, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do it forever. And stuck at it, loved the people, absolutely loved the people I, I trained and raced with. We just did a ball. So my first year was just fun. We didn't know how good we were, we didn't know how bad we were, which was probably a good thing. And it was just fun. So I was like, I'm actually loving this sport now, quite, quite into it. Uh, my second year, and I was studying law at the time, so I kind of went in theory to be a lawyer. So you can see how well that turned out. Uh, my second year, I then became a senior in the senior team in rowing. So now I'm quite ambitious and I'm competitive. And I think, right, my novice year went well, senior team, here we come. And they again wanted four, they wanted 16 women, four fours. And I went to the trials and did all the rest. And then we went to a meeting a little bit this, where we all sat in this auditorium. And they said, right, we'll read out the boats in order. I said, okay, fine. Top boat, here I come. They read out the top boat, and I wasn't in that. And I thought, well, fair enough. There's four really good girls in the squad, so that's fair enough. Second boat. Second boat didn't make that. Not happy. Third boat didn't make that. And I thought, I'm in the fourth boat. I'm in the bottom boat of the whole senior team. They read out the fourth boat. I didn't make that. <laughs> Again, this is not a funny story, people. <laughs> this is tragedy. So I'm th in this meeting, thinking, now either... I'm so good that I'm not in a boat. <laughs> All right, it seems funny now. It didn't the time. Or I'm so bad, and I was so bad, they made a fifth boat of sort of special rowers <laughs> who would, would, would get to go out rowing and could pay their fees and have a very nice social life and probably never amount to anything. And that was my calling my second year at university. So this is kind of a message in that when you try things, they're not always, it's not always obvious you're destined for greatness and it doesn't always happen like that. Um, in all seriousness, at that point, I left that meeting and I was really, really upset. I mean, I do laugh about it now. <laughs> with a lot of years between now and then. But that night, I was really, I was really upset and really frustrated and really... I went into, I don't know if you know Edinburgh, you know Arthur's Seat, which is in the centre of Edinburgh. It's kind of hill, mountain thing. And it was dark and it was kind of October time. And it was a time you should not be on Arthur's Seat alone. And I climbed Arthur's Seat alone in my frustration. And I remember having this moment where I just 
kind of swore to myself that I will never, ever be in that situation again where I am made to feel that way and feeling that low and I didn't do myself justice and I hadn't done everything I could in order to, to get selected for that year. And I had this moment on Arthur Seat. And I came back, um, got back into training, talked to the people around me, talked to the athletes around me, talked to the coach around me, talked to all the experts I could, complete sponges, learn off everyone around me until I could learn how to do it. Went to a coach and said, I need to... I was physically strong, I was fit, I just didn't know how to actually technically do it. And I didn't know how to apply myself. Talked to everyone I did, and then I began to get better. And I began to learn how to do it. And I got selected for boats again. And at the end of my third year at uni, um, I got to row for Scotland. And then in my fourth year, someone came and said, you should, you should go for Great Britain trials. And I just thought they were utterly insane, genuinely. For me, that was the Olympic team. They're on a huge pedestal. I'm absolutely nuts. Why on earth would I try and compete with that? And I went along to the trials. And what you realise at that point is it's not, it's not about you arriving as the perfect Olympian. It's about you arriving with potential. And the people who will pull you up to the level you need to be at that's their job. You just need to show that you are willing to do the hard work and you have what it takes on a basic level to get up that level. So I got into the British team and a few years after that I went to my first Olympic Games, which were in Sydney, in Australia, which was so much fun. The Sydney Games now, people talk about, are still one of the friendliest games we had. And until a few months ago, we talked about the best games we've ever had. And at that point, there'd never, ever been an Olympic medal in women's rowing. Ever, any colour, any year, any boat, nothing. So we went in and nobody really expected us to, to produce a medal that year. Uh, I was in the top boat, there was four of us in a boat. Um, and you get given this chance, you given this opportunity where, yes, on paper and in a lot of people's expert opinions, we weren't going to win a medal. But we had this moment, we had this, this one race, this final, where for six and a half minutes, it was in our hands and we got a chance. And we met the night before, and we talked to each other about what that race would mean and why it was important to each one of us. And all of us were incredibly honest about what that meant. Um, two of the girls that were sisters, their mum had died the year before, so they talked about that. One of the girls had been in the team, then got deselected, then got reselected, and everyone's had this incredible... Everyone has these huge sort of rollercoaster journeys behind them, and we all talked about what it meant. And it brought us together as a four, and it made that race so much more important than a rowing race. It was really, it was emotional and it was heart and soul stuff. And we went to the start line and you can either listen to everyone who will tell you this is how it should happen rationally or you can say, okay, fine, but you know what? We're going to do something different and we're going we're to create something special here. Um, to get an Olympic medal, we would have to stay in front of the Ukraine quad at that point. Um, so Germany were a favourite to win, Russia were a favourite for silver, Ukraine were a favourite for bronze. If we could stay in front of Ukraine, we'd get a medal. So we raced that race with, I'm not joking, the first 200 metres of it, me going, please don't mess up, please don't mess up, please don't mess up, because I was really quite inexperienced. Um, we came into the race, we've got a race plan, we know what we're doing, it's very structured, it's quite detailed. One of the girls is giving all the instructions as we race down the course, it's unfolding as we hope it to would, we're ahead of Ukraine, we're kind of very disciplined, we're very focused. It got to about the last 300 metres, it got very exciting. There are crowds yelling and deafening, and there were four women. In all honesty, we just started screaming at each other in excitement. I don't even know what we said. But we burst across the line in a kind of Wah! moment. And um, it's not something I necessarily recommend in the Olympic final, but it worked. Uh, and I knew we'd got the bronze medal. We came into the landing stage to get the medals. And they said, oh, we can't give it out yet because we're waiting for the photo finish. And I thought I had no idea that the Germans and Russians were so close for gold silver. And they said, no, no, it's between you and the Russians for silver bronze. And I remember, honest to God, first thought, oh, don't worry, I've got an Olympic medal. That is the best thing in the world to have. I don't care what colour it is. That was the happy days when I didn't care what colour they came in. Things change. And this is how fast things change, because at the start of that photo finish, I was over the moon with the bronze, and that's all I wanted. It took 12 minutes for them to decide. Halfway through that, so six minutes later, I'm starting to think silver might be quite nice. Six minutes after that, I'm thinking... I'll be a bit disappointed now. I don't get the silver. And we won the silver by eight hundredths of a second, which is about this much in boat terms. And I've got a copy of the photo finish. And it is a little bit like, okay, sure. 
We are so close, and we just, we just nudge it. So Sydney, to me, was about having this incredible dream. And it might be unrealistic, it might have been a little bit out there, but you get given an opportunity and you just grab it. And that was, that was, that was kind of Sydney. Um, I went to Athens four years later, and Athens to me was all about belief. Um, I was in a pair this time with a girl, Kath, and we were challenged in so many ways in the time leading up to it. Everything went wrong that could go wrong. You know, as an athlete, you want perfect preparation, and you do everything in your power to make it happen, and things can still go wrong. We had injuries, we had illnesses, we had damage to our boat, we had issues with the coach, we had, you know, you name it, things were going wrong around us, and we were constantly tested how much we cared about that thing we're after. And you utterly have to believe in something that strongly that when all those tests come, you're still willing to go, yeah, I still want to do this. Um, we also, when we got another silver that year, and the biggest difference for the whole team wise, whereas in Sydney, it was the first medal we ever got for women's rowing. Not just the belief in what you want to do gets challenged, but also the belief in, in what you think is possible. So we went from feeling in, in Sydney, it was a kind of, this incredible one result. The biggest impact that I had was everyone on the team felt that they could do that as well. So we only took eight women onto, onto Athens and every single one came back on the Olympic medal because everyone believed that it was possible then. They knew how to train, they knew how to compete, they knew what they're aiming for. And the biggest thing about Athens was this incredible belief in we could bring back medals and we will bring back medals. And every single one brought back an Olympic medal. Um, the biggest problem was none of them were gold. They were all silver and bronze medals. Uh, and, but we felt we knew what we were doing now. We had a little bit of consistency behind us. So moving towards Beijing, Beijing became all about the gold. And to really understand what happened in Beijing, you need to totally understand when you set out to do something and you will not accept anything less, when, when the win or the gold is your only possible conceivable result, then you buy into it in every way you can. And you, we spent four years, every decision we made in four years was about that one result. And everything we did was how we can get that one result. And every race we had, whether we won or we lost, was how can we make it better for the Olympic final in Beijing. And we came towards Beijing. Uh, we had three years of world championships and we won each year. So we're triple world champions coming into Beijing. And it was all set for the, the gold, the first ever gold medal. And in Beijing, China, for the first time, announced very publicly as the host country that they would, top, they would top the medal table, and they'd never topped it before. They had to beat USA to top the medal table, and they would do it in Beijing. And they targeted certain events and certain sports, and they had calculated how many results they needed to win and top the medal table, and one of the events was our event. So we met a very, very fast Chinese quad in Beijing. Um, we didn't meet them until the final of the Olympics. We, we broke the Olympic record in our heat. They broke it by a little bit more, and we were going to meet in the final. And we were, you know, very like Sydney. All, everything had changed in our standards of what we did, but we absolutely knew we had the six minutes to make a little bit of history. And for 1,800 metres of a 2,000 metre race, we led. And it was the first time I've ever led an Olympic final. And in the last 200 metres, and we talked about it, if we were ever threatened, nobody would overtake us there because it's the Olympic final and it means too much. And you just would never let anyone overtake you there. And then we met this quad that put in a, a sort of finish, the last 200 metres that we couldn't match, we could not compete with. And they rode through us and they beat us on the line. And in front of their home crowds, they were absolutely ecstatic. And if you look at any footage of us, every single person in our boat puts their head down and everyone's in tears instantly. Because as much as eight years before, the silver medal was everything to me, the bronze would have been everything. Eight years on, with different expectations, with different experiences, with different standards, nothing, nothing was going to be enough apart from the gold, and anything less would be failure. So I talk about winning in Sydney, I talk about losing in Beijing, even though it's exactly the same colour of medal. And it's, 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 your, it's where you're aiming for mentally. And we came in, and uh, it's a very... The only thing that cuts through the exhaustion and the, you know, the physical exhaustion, the mental exhaustion, is the result. And knowing that we'd come second meant we failed. And my initial reaction, my first instinct was, how can we make that better for next time? And then it hits you like an absolute brick wall that that was it and there's no next time. That it's done and that's history and that result will stand forever. 
Um, and we came into the Lions stage and we, we went to the media thing and then went on to the medal pontoon and got our silvers. And we were all, you know, inconsolable. And uh, it's really interesting people's reaction because I did get asked, we got anonymously asked through, through a web thing, website after that, can you ask the women's quad how it felt to have wasted four years of their life? And uh, we also got asked, how, how can you, how, why, do you, why do you show upset, why did you show tears when it was, you know, should have been a respectful moment for other people who'd won? And it's, when you, what you watched this, this summer, if you watched the Olympics, was people living out utter hopes and dreams very publicly and very, you, you run on instinct and emotion and you don't, you don't plan for the losses and you don't plan for what you're gonna say if you lose, you just react. And it's, it is so honest emotion you get to see when you watch sport at that level. Um, and I had a massive decision to make after Beijing whether or not to continue. I got a letter handwritten to me, um, care of my local rowing club, which was very disappointing for you, Catherine. Maybe it's time you stopped, you went off, Maybe got married, had a family, did something you'd be better at. I'd like to see you happy, that kind of thing. You get people who give you advice the whole time on what they sh you should do and shouldn't do. Uh, but for me, if it was if I still had the hunger, if I still had the passion, and the most important person I spoke to in the minutes or the, in, within an hour of losing in Beijing was I saw my mum, and she gave me this massive hug, and uh, she said, promise me you'll be there in London. And it was, it wasn't I was going to promise there and then, but it gave me the reassurance that actually the people that were important to me were backing me still. And it was worth kind of going on. And then the biggest draw, of course, with the London Home Games. I spoke to Denise Lewis, who won the heptathlon back in Sydney and who commentates the BBC now. Um, and she was saying, Catherine, you've got to go on. It's a home games. So I've been retired eight years. This is back in Beijing, she chatted to me. And I'm wondering what I can come back and compete in. Because, you know, my body's falling apart, but if I could stand still, maybe do shooting or archery or something, I want to be involved. It's the most incredible opportunity as an athlete to do home games. So, joined back up, and I got in a, a double with a girl, Anna, three years ago. And we just had the most fun. We just had the most fun of the last three years. Um, unbeaten for 22 races leading up to the Olympic Games. And suddenly, it was all back on. The opportunity comes back and you get this chance. And for us, rather than trying to make sure everything happened in order to win, we sort of started from the point that we could win. We knew we could win. Now let's remove anything that would stop us from winning. Let's look at anything that could be in our way, mentally, physically, any weakness, and let's just remove it. So we just are this absolutely unbeatable machine. Um, and we loved it. We had so much fun doing it. It was just, it was, it was just great three years. And what we knew that London was going to be about was about whether we could deliver, deliver the performance of our lifetime in front of the home crowd under the pressure of millions of people watching and expecting. And we, we talked about how actually the home crowd can be quite negative and can be a, a quite difficult thing to cope with. Um, and what we did was we were out in Italy in training camp beforehand and our coach and support staff got gathered together and they said, we're going to, we're going to practice putting you off. So we're gonna have a race, you're gonna do a 2,000 meter race, and we'll have some distractions, see how you cope. So we had one coach who took a little rubber dinghy out to the start, dived off it, started swimming among the boats. He was having far more fun than we were, by the way, at this point. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people who were making no noises and screaming and shouting and hooters and all the rest. In all honesty, there was maybe, I don't know, 15 of them. And then we came to Dorney, where we raced in London, and there was 30,000 people. So all the good intentions in the world, you cannot create what home Olympics crowd is going to be like. And I all, I've been asked, did you hear the crowd? Did you hear when you're competing? Can you block it out? Can you hear the crowd? 30,000 people. Guys, you don't block that noise out. <laughs> it is everywhere. It is inside you. You hear it. You feel it. You sense it. Um, and the hardest thing leading up to the London was our own massive expectations. Um, our, our chances of this could be the time. The, every interview I did was three silvers, could this be the gold? Um, and you try and draw on everything, everything you know to get this r result right. Uh, but everywhere we went, we had games makers who were volunteers, and a lot of them were rowing volunteers at our course. And they were told not to engage with you, not directly, when it came to the race. So they had to sort of, you know, obviously do their job, but not distract you. But we'd worked with them for a week by that point, by the time our final came along. 
So you'd go and put your bag in and they'd just go, oh. <laughs> and, you'd get, and you'd get all this, which is lovely, but when you get it 100 times in a row, you're starting to get a little bit nervous now. Um, the Olympic final itself is the most thrilling but utterly terrifying moment you can imagine. You are running on so much adrenaline, your mind thinks frighteningly fast. So in a split second, you can go from really positive thoughts to really negative thoughts to really distracted thoughts to thinking about the millions of people watching at home, thinking about the billions of people watching around the world, thinking about your mum and dad who are watching in the stands again. Watching, uh, you can think about the best days you've raced, you can think about the worst thing that can happen in the race, and your mind just flicks like this, and you're just left crazed. And I remember getting to Beijing final, I sit in the start line thinking, how can I do justice to, by that point, 10 years of rowing, everyone I've ever worked with, everyone who's ever supported me, how do I put that into one race? I got to the London start line, and it was exactly the opposite, and I thought about nothing but the very first stroke of the race. And it's the biggest thing I can say, if you find yourself in a situation which is so much pressure and so much expectation, so much thought behind it and people involved in it, the simplest thing is to cut it all out and just think about one thing that you can control. Just really make it simple, absolutely make it simple. All that stuff is still there. I didn't forget that it was the London Olympic final, I didn't forget all the people that supported me, but at that point I just need to think about the first stroke. And in the rowing race, the first 100 metres was the only bit that we had no public. They were actually sort of cordoned off. So it was deathly silent at the start. And there's just nothing left to be done. And you just sit there and you can actually hear your heart. And you're trying to tell yourself, you're confident, you're fine, we know we're gonna win, it's fine. And your adrenaline is racing and your heart's racing, your pulse is racing. And Anna keeps going, it was utterly horrific, wasn't it? I keep trying to say really positive things, no, it was inspiring. It's quite horrific too. But you wouldn't swap that for anything. You would not swap that moment for anything. You want to be there. You want to deliver that. You want to get the chance one more time. And we didn't say anything to each other in the start line. We just said, look, and they're kind of, well, here we go. And when the gun went, we absolutely leapt out, almost a little bit too fast. Um, but we leapt out and we led again. And we were leading the whole way down. I would not let myself think for one second what the result might mean. I was absolutely in the moment, just in one stroke, every stroke, that's all I thought about. Our coach said he knew within 30 strokes we were going to win, which I question because he's, he's not that positive normally. Uh, Anna said she knew by halfway we were going to win. From a purely detached, she knew the speed of the boat, the speed of other, our opposition. Um, I would not let myself believe it until we crossed the line. And if you watch any video of it, I still look like I am about to kill someone <laughs> until we crossed the line. Uh, and I almost had to suppress all the emotion part of it and, and thinking what could happen. The only time I thought for one second about anything, apart from the moment I was in, was when we entered the stadium. And you basically, in a rowing race, you row into a stadium. So it, the, the few hundred people at the start builds up to a few thousand until you come into this 30,000 wall of sound, echoing both sides, rolling down into water, getting magnified, deafening. And I had this split second when it was getting louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And I could feel it and the boat could feel it and I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear, certainly couldn't hear Anna. And the only thing I thought for a split second is how loud does the sound get before your ears start to bleed? <laughs> and then I thought, what are you thinking, Catherine? Get back in the, back in the game. I never found out, thank goodness, because it would not have looked good for the photos, bleeding ears. Um, but we crossed the line and it was utter, unbelievable, indescribable joy. It wasn't a sense of relief, it wasn't a sense of, oh, thank goodness we've done it, it wasn't a sense of, thank goodness it's over, it was utter joy, absolute utter dream come true stuff. And there's a little bit of footage at the end that the commentator says, what you're watching now, ladies and gentlemen, is that dreams do come true. And that sums it all up for me. This, this incredible journey I had, this incredible career I had, this thing was about this, seemingly impossible dream for so long and it was what I was aiming for so long I had these wonderful people along me every step of the way and it was about this ultimately it came down to this one day that Anna and I were going to put it all on the line and see what we could do we did fantastic coaches and support and network and family who were all made it happen and then this one day we, we got it in our hands to see if we could deliver it and it has made everything worthwhile I, like I said back in Sydney when I started it was about 
it was kind of a hope, even more than a dream. It was, it was a kind of unrealistic, amazing thing we set out to do. By Athens, it was about how much we believed in it and how much it meant to us and how special it was, and that utter constant testing, constant belief. Um, in Beijing, it was about having different standards and living up to them every single day. And about London, it was about forming this strong team that would just, on the day, deliver. Just deliver what's asked of you. And that was it. And it has, every, every day since then has been incredible. We've had so much fun. Uh, I finally got to meet David Beckham, if any of you were watching, and interesting. And in the funniest day about the day I met David Beckham was we were in the BBC studios with David, I don't know I like to call them. Um, <laughs> he doesn't call me Catherine, by the way. Uh, ben Ainsley, uh, Michael Johnson, the commentator, and Tom Daly had been there as well. And we were, uh, we were going to be introduced to the, the public outside. And we uh, were waiting to go outside, but it was the night that Mo Farah won his second gold. So as we were waiting to go outside to be introduced to the crowd, all we heard was, we want Mo, we want Mo. And we all thought, oh my goodness, they don't want us. And um, uh, one of the directors, the BBC directors, went out to check the sound or something, sound levels, and he went out, and there was this cheer and this massive boo. They realised it was him. And then he came back in, and they went back to, we want Mo. And Gabby Logan was hosting, so she came down to see us all excited. And she's like, you're all ready? And we all went, we're not going out there. There's no way. She said, why? And she said, we're like, they want Mo. <laughs> but she made us go out, and they did cheer. Well, they cheered David particularly, but it was fine. But you, you had this incredible time where you meet loads of people and celebrate the fact uh, on all this stuff has happened. And it's all slightly unreal, because like I said, I never planned for this in my life. I had... I always had dreams, I had ambitions. I didn't see them in this shape. I didn't see them in this way. I didn't see what this would bring and how wonderful it's been. And I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. Um, but I would, the, the biggest things, and I've been to enough speeches in my time, I've been to enough graduation talks, I've been to all these things. I know that a shadow of a doubt, you will all go in a year or two, you'll forget most of this. I absolutely know that. Don't worry, I'm not going to test you in any way when I find you in five years' time. Uh, I don't expect you to remember most of this, but if I can leave you with stuff, it would be that it is so, it's so wonderful to find a passion in life. Now, some of you might have it already. You might know what you want to do. You might know what it is. Some of you won't know, and that's exciting, and that's where you spend your life finding out. Never compromise with it. Find something that challenges you and drives you and stretches you all the time, and you will find more about yourself than you ever thought was possible. And also that there kind of is no right and wrong way. There is no set path that you should be on. There is no way to be. You are all so different, and that's what makes you all so special. Because everyone I've raced in my career, everyone I've met, are very different characters, and that's what made them so successful in their own right. There's kind of, you know, you are the only person in the world like you. And you should never change that to try and be like anyone else. Even, even people you have role models of, even people you, you know, can hear worship, and I, I have my own idols and role models, and I love them, but you never change to be like them. You've been inspired by them, you learn from them, but it's so important to stay true to you, and that's when suddenly a whole world of possibility opens up. So, you know, be different, be proud to be you, find out what it is that you're all about, and then find that passion and follow it wherever it goes, and you have no idea what's out there waiting for you and what you'll do to that world when you get out there. But I wish you all the very best luck in the world. And if any of you do get to the Olympics, which some of you might, the odds are, uh, one, I'd recommend it, and two, don't take four times to get it right, but when you do get it right, make sure they give you one of these at the end. <laughs>
I'm just wondering what to say <clears throat> after that uh, quite amazing talk by Catherine. I mean, what we've seen this afternoon, not just you here in, in, in school here in Loch Haber, but around the country, is an exceptional insight into the mind and the drive and the focus and the determination of an Olympic champion. These Olympic champions are exceptional. Let's recognise this exceptional Olympic champion. I'm going to uh, have some questions now, but before doing so, these things don't, as you know, happen by accident. I would like to thank uh, Callum and Megan for introducing us so well. I'd like to thank this school for being remarkable hosts. They've done a tremendous job in helping us with this programme, as have the BBC. And I, I would like to just remind you that the Royal Society of Edinburgh has been here and will be here in Loch Aber for some time to come. And there's a whole team of people in all the schools and outside schools and museums and poets and musicians who will be taking part. So thanks to everybody who's been doing that. <laughs> so now it's your chance and uh, I'm going to start by taking questions from the hall. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes. The uh, how has your training affected your diet? My diet? Yeah. You're commenting on me, are you now? No. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the best things about rowing is we train so much that actually we do need to eat quite a lot as well, which is quite nice. Um, we work brilliantly with nutritionists. We've got some really top-class nutritionists who not only advise us on what we should eat, how much we eat, should eat, uh, what type of food we should eat, but also when we should eat, which is crucial now, about eating straight after training, ideally. Um, but they also try and make it very realistic, so they know we have to lead normal lives as well. So, you know, if we go out for dinner and you can't always have, you know, steamed broccoli and sort of a slice of white fish that's this big, then it needs to be something that you can actually exist in the real world as well. So we have this combination of, ultimately, it's a very, very healthy diet, but it's not, it's not anything more than that. It's you know, it's, you should be able to get everything you need from a, a normal diet, and it's the, the right mixture. So for us, it's, it's a healthy amount of carbohydrates, but it's a huge amount of protein. It's now sort of the biggest focus in the muscle building and stuff. But fresh fruit and veg and all that things. And also that nothing's actually banned, nothing's not allowed. You know, I get asked by very small children generally about, do you eat chocolate? And, you know, I'd love to say no, but yes, I do. Uh, you know, we just have a, a, a realistic diet, nothing, nothing into excess, um, but, but something that, and we do, we burn it off. We train, you know, three times every day most days, and that burns off most things that you can eat anyway. Question from this side. I can't have answered all your questions, come on. Hands up, hands up. Yes. Who in the GB team has the most potential to succeed and become an uh, worldwide name like Chris Hoy in Rio 2016? Oh, blimey, that's a tough one. I've been asked that one before. I thought I'd answered all my questions. Uh, 2016. It's hard because all the people that you... All the people that spring to mind are people that are probably already doing well. And, and this Olympics, a lot of people who were predicted to go well in 2016 have already gone well because it was the effect of the, the home nation. So a lot of people outperformed their expectations and a lot of people's expectations of them already. Uh, so trying to find a new name that everyone can bet on and earn lots of money for 2016 is a lot tougher. Um, yeah, Chris Hoy said he's not going to be around, is he? We're running out of guaranteed. Oh, we've got amazing people like Chris Hoy and Ben Ainsley who've been around for a long time doing amazing medals, but even they can't quite give up on it. Uh, so, uh, I'm not going to be able to give you a name right now. I'm going to have to think about that one. The exciting thing is, there's always a brilliant mix, and, and Team GB better than ever before, where we've got huge amounts of experience and success now across a range of sports. We've got Olympic champions and a lot of sports and medalists and, and success stories. And they will, success absolutely breeds success. So every, every different sport within the Team GB setup learns how to be successful from the inspirational athletes they have and also inspirational athletes from, from other 
other sports that they work closely with and and even the how the each sport is put together how the structure of it gets inspired by the things so the cycling team has been very successful sailing team is very successful the equestrian team were very successful this year and they all sort of breed off each other and learn things so both on the sort of management side but also the athlete side everyone learns from everyone of how to be successful uh, which is a long-winded way of saying I don't know yet ask me in 2015 um, we have some questions from other uh, schools across uh, the land, and there's one here from Emma in St Andrews, um, which says, uh, you've already achieved incredible feats. How do you set new goals for yourself? Uh, it's, it is hard. It's, um, I think the importance of goals can never be underestimated. I think, as I said, sort of referred to before, having, having a, a one huge goal is so important and it drives everything. It drives, uh -huh. for us, it drives the really miserable dark cold mornings where you don't want to get out of bed and it's not very inspiring. So then to cope with that big goal, you have lots of little goals that you set the whole time yeah. to move you forward and things that are a little bit more achievable and you can do every week and every or day and every week and every month and then every year to get you to the big goal. Um, and for the last 15 years, I've been in the British rowing team, and it's all been, it's all, all the success is because of having, having what you want to achieve. You need to be very clear, especially in any team, very clear what you're aiming for, otherwise people get lost. Uh, and you also need to know your role within that, you need to know how valuable your role is and how you will add to this goal. And that's just how I've functioned for years and years now. And this is the first time, the first mm -hmm. time in 15 years where I've kind of, a little bit cast adrift. I don't have an obvious goal. No. I don't have one in mind. I don't know if it will be in sport or outside sport. And it's a little bit like I was saying to these guys. It's it's almost having to tap back into myself and right. find what what's important to me, what I'm passionate about, what I still have this excitement to do. And then within that, when then when I know the area, then I'll be able to choose the the mm. goal. But I do think goals are very important to have. I wonder if that's. I mean, that might not be surprising because the goal you set yourself was so high and along the way you had successes and failures in your own mind mm. you still had that goal but what i was interested in was <clears throat> the way in which you and the coaching team actually channeled that goal towards success because you did emphasize they had a big part to play mm. in that mm. um yeah i mean there's this is the thing, you see Anna and myself this year sitting on the podium getting our gold medals that's now somewhere, and there's now being worn out there, it's marvellous to see it making the rounds. And uh, yeah, I just draw attention to you, well, there you go. Up, <laughs> Who's got the medal at the moment? <laughs> no, it's being worn. Ah. Yeah, it's fine, it's part of the school uniform now. Um, you could add that to the school uniform actually, a gold medal. Uh, but you see two of us, or one of us, or eight of us, or however many people are in a boat, you see that, those people getting the medals. But actually, behind the scenes, there are countless number of people who, who are worthy of those medals. And, and like you said, the, the coach I've worked with the last 11 years has created all those goals yeah. and has been right there. And it's kind of... The most exciting thing of the new project is getting those people together. Uh, so us as athletes, our coach and almost choosing what the goal should be and having this incredible thing to aim for and then bringing in the team around you. So we have you know, experts in um, you know, nutrition, we've talked yeah. about psychology, physiotherapy, medical, yeah. biomechanics, strength and conditioning, you, know, you go yeah. on and on and on. And the exciting thing is bringing all these people in. Because yeah. once you've got one goal, everyone yeah. knows what you're aiming for. Yeah. Everyone knew for us it was about the London gold medal. Yeah. Nothing less would do. And they all want to play their part to get it. So that when people feel they've got a valuable role in that amazing aim or goal, <coughs> then they, it becomes... They also have faith good. in your capability. Yeah, they need to. I mean, they, they probably have doubts every now and again, which is healthy. But um, they, you know, they want their challenges too. They want to find ways to make you better the whole time. And... And you all, you all have to have faith in the ultimate goal. I've got um, a couple of questions uh, from the internet here. One is, um, have you done anything else in your life apart from rowing during the last 15 years or so? Is that from my mum? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mum? Uh, have I done anything else in my life? Yeah, a little bit. Um, it's, it, sometimes it feels no, in all honesty. Sometimes it feels like it has been, obviously, the, the overriding thing. But I, like I said when I started, I actually went to university to get a, well, a real job. 
and a degree, and I went to study law. And I honestly thought that's probably what I would end up doing. For me, law was uh, law was what I probably watched a lot of TV and film and read books about. In that, it was about you know truth and justice and making speeches and making an impact on people and saving and changing the world for the better and all those wonderful big concepts. Um, and I studied law for four years at Edinburgh, which I loved. Although when you do sit in some of the sort of you know tax lectures and law lectures, you think. They don't make films out of this part. So I had to get a reality of what the actual law was in a lot of ways. But I've always, I've always had an interest in it, so I've always wanted to continue it alongside my rowing. And it's, it's just a different stimulation, it's a different challenge. So I did a master's when I finished my law degree at Glasgow University in, in medical law and medical ethics. And now I'm trying to complete my PhD at King's College London. Um, in homicide? It's in homicide. It's in murder, everyone. <laughs> So not only do I have a black belt, but I now study the perfect crime. You're serious about this. So <laughs> it is. I'm a serious kind of girl, really. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. It's real. It's real extreme end of, of human behaviour and and how we as a society try and deal with that human behaviour and how we punish it and how we mm. look at it. And it's just. It's actually by studying that, I've also I did a lot of interviews with some of the most fascinating minds I think in in criminal justice in this country. And it's mm. you know. I've, I've talked to a range of wonderful people, so it's kept do me we, busy. Do we have another question from the pupils in Lochaber? Not like, can I yeah, keep the medal? Are, yes. um, where do you find the motivation to keep going and training and then a race? Uh, motivation is a really interesting one because it's, it's so different for everyone. You know, I know people who've been motivated um, in a kind of negative way. They, don't, they never feel good enough. They never feel the, they always feel they'll be beaten and that almost keeps them going. I know people who get motivated because they're incredibly, they need the confidence, they need to feel they're the best thing in the world at what they do, and that's a motivation. Uh, I think a little bit back to goals. I've always, I've always said I'd continue rowing it if I felt I could be better, and if I felt I was enjoying it. And for me, it needs to be enjoyable. It's not every single day. It is pretty awful some days, out in bad conditions and bad weather, mm. and when you're not doing well and you're being told, you're going up and down the river, in the darkness and the hail and the rain and you're being told by your coach that you're not good enough and you know a lot of that that's the reality of it a lot of the time but the motivation comes from partly getting the chance to do something like the olympic games having the having the big dream is very motivating having something that's that not everyone could do and you don't know if you can do it but it's something that is really hard to aim for because it then it then makes you try and prove yourself in every way. So, you know, I had to be so mentally tough and physically tough and all these things and learn about tactics and strategies. And that challenge is very motivating in itself. Um, but I think always, always learning and always feeling there's something else to do. I think once you feel you've done it and it doesn't get you excited anymore, then it's time to find something else. But while you've got something that excites you and is something that's quite hard to aim for, but it, that's the motivation. It's, it's kind of the what next. You want to be the first in something. You want to be do something different from everyone else. That's big motivation. There's a question here from Edinburgh from Craig. It's a, a very interesting practical question. Is um, what do you think the future impact of your success and of the the rest of the GB team, rowing team, will have on the funding for the sport after 2012? And did you see a difference in funding levels after your success in previous games? I've been very lucky. I came in to the rowing team in 1997 and the National Lottery started in 96, so just before. And what I saw, the biggest impact was when I joined the team, if you wanted to compete for your country, you had to fund it yourself. So the people on the team when I joined were all in debt, um, all trying to hold down a part-time job, um, loans, overdrafts, you name it, to just try and get through. Uh, the National Lottery came in and as long as a sport could show it could perform internationally, then it, it would attract funding. And rowing's attracted funding since that point. And what it's meant is that athletes can train full time, that athletes um, can put their sport first, that we can bring in great experts and great coaches and go on the training camps we want to go, buy the equipment we need to do. And there's it's no coincidence that, you know, Sydney, Athens, Beijing and London have all been the most successful games because we've had funding since then. So the money itself makes a huge, huge difference. And the, the, sort of the, the test for sports and for athletes, we are always performance tested. So a sport will only keep its funding if it's 
achieving. And same as an athlete, you'll only get funded if you, if you are succeeding. So it's constantly monitored, it's constantly checked. And as long as we're performing, so this year we got three Olympic golds for the women's team and one for the men, we will now continue to attract funding because of that success. Um, but it does then make you very competitive internationally because we've got a very, very supportive structure. And what's been good is we've now got guaranteed money for the next four years. Mm. So it means planning ahead is much, much easier as well for four years. But one of the biggest impacts, uh, the success has meant that the money stayed in, in our sport. But the massive impact you, say, you see since London is almost the, the emotional change. And we talk about legacy as being what won the Olympics and what will continue. Uh, and a lot of people talk about it in terms of the structures, so the buildings, the venues, um, or the starting the new generation getting involved. Um, but the biggest legacy in some ways was just the attitude change in that people had this huge pride in what we achieved as a nation. And that's all ages, so that's not just the next generation. Um, and I think, I think yes, the, the funding makes a difference, but actually the people believing they can do things and achieve makes the bigger difference. And that, that sense of belief you need in the first place, and then the funding makes that belief sort of come true. There's another question here. I'm not sure whether you're prepared to answer it. Ooh. This is from Sean in Fort William. Are you going to compete in Rio? <laughs> Sean. Um, <laughs> tricky one. I don't know is the absolute honest answer. Yeah. Uh, it's been the most incredible four months since we won. And probably every day I feel differently. Some days, the, if you're an athlete, the Olympic Games is by far the most incredible event you can be part of. It's so special. Uh, and if someone said now, would you do Rio? Now, you would do it in a heartbeat because the Olympics itself is fantastic. Do you want to do the four years that it'll take to now and then is the bigger question. And you know, the hunger needs to be there, the, the commitment needs to be there, the, you know, I'll never be able to go back. It would have to be to go on and win, which takes a lot of work. Um, Anna hasn't made her decision either. Obviously, you'd want to be in the right partnership for, for looking forward. There's so many things that now mm -hmm. come into play. Um, at the same time, for all of us, we've suddenly got the other worlds open up to you as well. And there's very exciting other things in life to, to pursue. So I'm definitely going to take my time because at the moment, while, while your mind is everywhere and you're changing your thoughts every minute of the day, um, and whoever I speak to, I get excited by it. So I should be doing that. Or, oh, I should be doing that. Or, I should be doing that. Um, and while I feel like that, I shouldn't make a decision. So I'm taking my time to decide. You mentioned, uh, uh, we've run out of time for questions, unfortunately. We've got more questions coming in all the time. Um, but you mentioned the, the, the tremendous wall of sound and, and the cheering that you encounter of 30,000 people at the end of your race. If, you, if, if we here and around the country cast our minds back to that moment, it wasn't at all certain that the UK British team were going to perform as well as they did. Your success was celebrated with huge enthusiasm, not just by these 30,000 people, but by more than 30 million people around the UK. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you.